Even though we live in a time of unprecedented technology and communication, people in our world are losing touch with one another. Isn't that true? I mean, it, it, you can go into a restaurant or a coffee shop or an airport or any public place and people are sitting right next to each other, families or boyfriends and girlfriends, husbands and wives, sitting there at a table together or in chairs close to one another. And instead of engaging with one another, what are they doing? That's right, they're texting. In fact, my daughter tells me that when she's with a group of her friends, they're texting each other, sitting in the same room. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, one of the primary reasons is that many of us are more interested in ourselves than in others around us. Now, we, we don't like to admit that, but we're more interested agenda and, and what we are interested in, looking out for number one, even if it comes at the expense of our relationships with each other. And the world, as well as many Christians, has fallen prey to what we might call the footstool fable, where I want to elevate myself or I want to better my situation at your expense. That's a problem. I grew up in a family where there was a lot of striving and strife. And I hope I can move this one just aside a little bit, and that's not going to mess anybody up. Because, you know, I like to wander, and uh, it will be more entertaining in the message if somehow I trip over one of those. <laughs> but less effective at making my point, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, the interesting thing is, in my family growing up, uh, there was a lot of striving and strife. Um, I remember from my earliest memories a lot of anger and yelling and, and, and calling family members calling each other names. It was just the way that I remember in my early years our home being a lot of striving and strife between my parents uh, who did eventually, as I've told you before, get divorced quite a few years later. But as I grew up, there was just this constant desire to somehow better myself at your expense. And I call that the footstool fable, because the world tells us this fable, this fable that it's okay to better myself even if it's at somebody else's expense. Even if it adversely affects my brother or my sister or my friend, or my family. There was likely some striving and some strife in the family of James and John, who were nicknamed what? The sons of thunder. Now, what is one of the characteristics of thunder? Thunder is loud. So obviously, you know, we think of John and we think of John as being this meek and quiet and mild character who lays his, chest gent his head gently on the chest of Jesus, which we have challenges with in our culture today anyway. And, and, and we think of that picture, but, but the truth is, that is not what a son of thunder would tend to elicit in your mind, is it? Sons of thunder. So the, at least there must have, they, this must have affected their relationships somehow. And, and I would submit that this was due to what I call the footstool fable. So what is the footstool fable? How does it affect us? And how can we overcome the footstool fable in our lives and in our churches? These are questions answered by Jesus. Notice Matthew chapter 20. If you have your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open a Bible and take a look at that. Matthew chapter 20 and follow along. I, I think there's value in actually looking in a Bible when we're studying the Bible, don't you? See, seems like an interesting concept. Um, and perhaps it would be good if I was giving the texts to the guys so they could project it. I'll, I'll try to remember to do that as well. But, but I like to look in a Bible. There's something about about opening up a Bible. We have electronic Bibles, you know, we have them on our iPads and we have them on our iPhones and we have them. So you can't just, you know, say, well, people aren't spiritual if they don't carry a Bible to church. Well, if you carry a phone these days, you're likely carrying a Bible, amen? 
fact, you have it everywhere you go. Hope you use those spare moments to click open and read something once in a while. But in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, we find the footstool fable as it is initiated. Let's look at what this says. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. That's all. Mrs. Zebedee, or Salome, as she's known in the Gospels, is proud of her sons. Though there is striving, there is strife potentially in their family because they are the sons of thunder, there probably was even more striving in their community and among their peers. And Mrs. Zebedee is the one who trains them in this, obviously, because she is striving on their behalf. She had probably thought about that request for some time. It didn't just dawn on her the night before. And there was probably even a certain motherly care that motivated her to want the very best opportunities for her children. She didn't ask for them to occupy the center throne. I mean, it wasn't like she wanted them to take Jesus' place or somehow usurp his authority. She asked for the throne on the right and the throne on the left. She wasn't being disrespectful to Jesus. After all, she, it came, she came, and it says she came doing what? Did you catch that? Kneeling. kneeling down. Kneeling down. Now, it's very interesting how sometimes we can do something physically or in appearance that makes us look one way when in actuality we are doing something else. I mean, just get the, get the feel of this. Here comes Salome mother of the sons of thunder, and she comes to Jesus, whom she knows she has a relationship with him of some sort, an interaction that has taken place, a history that has developed as her sons have been following him, and these family units have gotten together at different times in their homes, most likely. And so she comes to Jesus, and she says, she doesn't say, hey, Jesus, how are you? Oh, it's just wonderful to see you again. No. She comes directly to him, and she kneels down. And she doesn't say, Jesus, you are so majestic. You are so wonderful. Thank you so much for the way in which you are transforming my son's lives. Thank you, Lord, that you've allowed them to be your followers. None of that. She comes kneeling down, but while she's kneeling, which would tend to be a physical sign of respect and of uh, deference for his authority, instead of, of, of reflecting that in her words, she says, Jesus, please give my sons the best positions in your kingdom. So she's kneeling and demanding. Something none of us ever do when we come to God in prayer, right? Remember Jesus did say just one chapter earlier, Matthew 19, verse 28. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Salome got that part right. But her methods were clouded because her motives were mixed up. While it's perfectly understandable that a mother would want the best for her boys, she passed right over Matthew 19 and verse 30, where Jesus said, But many who are first will be what? Last. And many who are last will be what? First. And Matthew 20, verse 16, So the last will be what? And the first will be last. We've got the same four people answering. It's kind of warm in here. I hope you don't fall asleep today. The commentator Warren Wearsby suggests that Jesus spoke about a cross, but they were interested in a crown. wonder if that could describe us sometimes. And I would suggest that not much has changed in our world today either. And that's why the first thing that Christ would say to us today is manage your motives. 
First thing we learn from this story of the footstool fable is to manage our motives. It's really easy for our motives to get out of whack. That's an Aramaic word. Out of whack. James and John were interested in glory, in power, in rank. They wanted to be the closest to Jesus and they wanted to be higher than anyone else. And their mother desired the best for them. The name Siloam, notice this, actually means in the Greek clothing or clothed, and in the Hebrew clothing or covering. And clothing like motives can be good and they can be bad. And clothing like motives can uh, be used to cover and protect and shield in a positive way or they can conceal and be used to draw flattering attention to oneself. Interesting, Simone comes wanting to clothe her sons with this flattering position. She came in worship, but she also secretly wanted something. She bowed, but she also begged. She knelt down, but she sought favor. All three of them, she and her two sons, wanted their will done in their way. And so they kneel, but they demand their goals be fulfilled. Perhaps you can excuse Simone's misunderstanding, but James and John, it, it's hard to, to excuse them. They, they should have known better by this point. They'd been with Jesus quite a while now. It seems as if their ambition was for their own political advancement and self-glorification rather than for the advancement of God's kingdom and His glory. Oh, they, they were willing. They were willing to serve God in His movement. And, 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 but it was, it was extremely important to them that they be at the head of it. They, they wanted to serve, but they wanted to serve at the head, by the head, I should say. Now, have you ever wondered how those who were so close to Jesus could be so far from his purpose, so far from understanding what Jesus' kingdom purposes were for them? It goes to prove that you can be in the presence of God a lot of the time and be a part of God's movement and still miss the boat by having the wrong motives. Isn't that true? You can be in church every week. I can be in church every week. But be so preoccupied with our own desires and our own ambitions that we never really pick up on God's plan for our lives and for His church. 2 Timothy 3, 4 says that in the last days, men and women will be lovers of what? Pleasure more than lovers of God. Don't we see this being fulfilled today? Isn't this happening all around us? Isn't it even happening in the church? We need to be sure not to get personal ambitions in the way of God's design for our lives and for the church. A small boy and his sister were riding on the back of a brand new rocking horse that they had, they had gotten for Christmas. And they were riding on the back of this rocking horse and they were having a great time and they were squealing with glee and, and you know, doing wahoos and all that kind of thing that, that they would do you know, in their first experience with this new horse. And, and as they're going along, the little boy finally shouts out and he turns to his sister. He says, if one of us would get off, there'd be a lot more room for me. When faced with this mother's mixed up motives, Jesus asks a question to reveal what she's thinking. Jesus says, what is it you want? He reads right through her. What she is doing, kneeling at his feet, he knows that's not her motive to worship him. Why are you doing this? He asks. Who do you want to impress? Who is it that you are serving? And so Jesus' first antidote to the footstool fable is for us to check our motives, to manage our motives. The second antidote to the footstool fable is to anticipate difficulty. Notice where the story goes after the request. What Salome doesn't understand is the utter infeasibility 
or the level of sacrifice that will accompany her request if it is fulfilled. With budding conviction, Jesus responds to Mrs. Zebedee with the penetrating words in verse 22. Notice verse 22. She, he, Jesus says to Mrs. Zebedee, you don't know what you're asking. You ever had your kid come to you and they, they're making a request and they're saying, please, please, please please do this, please, or as a child you did it, or maybe as a teenager you did it, please let me do this, let me have this, let me go here, let me have this friend, let me wear this, let me whatever. And, and your response or the response to you is, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus said to them, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Can you do it? And it's very interesting the way the text is. It doesn't go to another verse. There's no pause. There's nothing to indicate that they even missed a beat. Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And immediately they respond, we can. They answered. We can. Yes, we can do it. Oh, how Jesus' words must have stung Somewhat. Salome really thought that she understood, as, as did James and John, evidently judging by their naive and hasty response. They, they thought they understood. They thought they knew what Jesus meant. They thought they, that Jesus was saying, hey, you know, there's a lot of responsibility to having a position of leadership, a position of influence. It's going to demand a lot of you. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is there's going to be a greater cost a greater sacrifice to following me and representing me than what you realize. Are you ready for it? Jesus is saying, you don't have a clue what you're asking for. That's what he's really saying. It's interesting, the word cup was a symbol. It was a symbol of suffering or affliction. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed... Matthew 26, verse 39, Jesus prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. An entirely different request than Salome's, isn't it? God, here's my cup, fill it up. Jesus, here's my cup, pour it out. Wow. In John 18, verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword away, Peter. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? A cup of sacrifice. Interestingly, both James and John answer this pointed question with complete confidence when Jesus asks them, Do you know what you're asking for? Can you, can you drink the cup? And, and they say, If you give us the prestigious position, Christ, we can drink the cup. We'll do it. They're clueless. But the course is set, and so Jesus responds in verse 23. You will indeed drink from my cup. They wanted glory, but Jesus tells them to get ready for grief. When we come seeking our own glory, it almost always will result in deep grief. Because God isn't about trying to prop us up in our own glory. God is about trying to fill us up with his cup of serving and selflessness. While we don't always understand how much we're going to suffer, we do know that if we are serious about following Christ and serving Christ wholeheartedly, we will face difficulty. Amen? We will. Those of us who've been at it long enough know that there will be times when it hurts to trust in God. Aren't there? It's true. It would feel better to be angry at God. It would feel better to curse God as Job's friends say to him, just curse God and die. I mean, come on. But no. To trust God sometimes hurts more than walking away would. Jesus knew that. He knew that was what would come down James and John's road. 
And while we don't always know in advance how much we're going to suffer, we do know that if we're serious about following Christ and serving Him wholeheartedly, difficulties will come our way. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to what? To suffer for Him. James didn't suffer long, but he lost his life as the first of the twelve disciples to be martyred in Acts 12, verse 2. John lived to be about 95 years old, as I talked about uh, a couple of months ago in, in my first here. John lived to be about 95 years old, but his life was filled with difficulty and hardship, and it culminated with his banishment to the island of Patmos in his elder age. He, I mean, he wasn't in an RV park or a retirement home, you know. He was in a place in a rock-hewn cave on a craggy island in the middle of the Aegean Sea. These two brothers didn't drink from Christ's cup of sacrifice and suffering. Uh, I mean, they did drink from it. And, and, and you and I today, we also will if we commit our lives entirely to Christ and to His kingdom mission, everything that that God asks you and me to do, He will bless in His way and in His time, and it will not be in vain. For even though James and John suffered a sacrifice they had no idea of when they asked Christ to elevate them to some significant role in His kingdom, which He did faithfully end up doing, didn't He? Even though they had no idea, they did suffer great sacrifice and trial, and yet it made them the impactful leaders of this new movement of Christ that became our heroes that we read and study about and want to emulate in our walk with God today. Everything that God asks you to do, He will bless in His way and in His time. And after checking our motives and expecting difficulty, then anticipating difficulty, the antidote to the footstool fable, the third one is to put others first. Putting others first. James and John had this kind of selfish ambition, but but what about the other ten disciples? I mean, they were good guys, right? It was just James and John. The problem. They were the ones who asked for the positions. It wasn't the other guys. Notice verse 24. Jesus turns to them. says, when the ten heard about this, Jesus is listening to them now. He's, he's overhearing them. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. They were indignant. I mean, this doesn't remind me of any church I've ever been in. This word indignant literally means in the Greek to be greatly afflicted. Greatly afflicted. They were really mad that these two were using a relative of Jesus to get special treatment and they weren't going to give up the top spots without a fight. They wanted those spots as much as James and John wanted those those spots. They were appalled by the brothers' lack of understanding of true servanthood. They were mad that these two got to Jesus first. The spiritual attitude of the ten wasn't any better than that of the two. No way were James and John going to get those top positions without a fight. What were they thinking anyway? I mean, who did they think they are? Think they're better than us? The other ten were ticked off, fearful that they were getting ripped off. How dare James and John steal their glory? We ever feel that way in the church? Nominating committee time or when some program is taking place or when somebody gets noticed for something we don't get noticed. Somebody else gets a position that we get passed over for. Somebody else gets the accolades when I put in just as much effort. Fighting for what we perceive to be best for me. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to be angry at the sin we see in others while we indulge the same ones in ourselves? (laughs) Interesting how that is, isn't it? That person's so selfish, I can't believe they're like that. Am I saying that because I'm also selfish? 
Here we see that selfless, selfishness always results in dissension. That's what we see in this story. Selfishness always di- results in dissension. When we think only of ourselves, community breaks down. Community breaks down and unity is replaced with division and backbiting. That's why one of the best things that we can do in the church is to serve together and serve one another. Amen? A church that serves together stays together. It's true. The same goes for a couple or a family. A family that serves one another and serves God together stays together. Amen? It took me a while to learn that lesson because of my family history. It's an interesting thing. We sometimes think that because I walk an aisle and I say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I love you. I want to dedicate my life to you. I'm going to serve you. That it automatically happens. I did that at 10 years of age. I recommitted my life to him as I told you at 17. I went away to college as a as an 18-year-old and began to take theology in, in, in preparation for ministry. And in my second year, I met my beautiful and wonderful wife, who is such a jewel to me. And I thought, that's it. Everything's solved now. It's all resolved. All that history, all that negative relational junk, all the ways in which I had related in my family, I have righted the ship. I have made the right choice by God's grace bringing that beautiful person into my life. It's all, it's all perfect now. Well, it may have all been perfect, but I wasn't. And a, and, and a lot of those same old patterns of being tempered, and using biting words, and having a motive and an attitude that was self-serving and selfish and self-centered began to creep up in our different interactions. And it began to erode at our relationship. Until one night after one of those episodes about my third year of ministry, we were crying on, air, on our separate sides of me, not, of course, letting my wife know oh, I was crying as well, because I was and tough, this man of God. But I had in a lump in my throat. Maybe I need to stand at this mic because this keeps cutting out. I had tears in my eyes and a lump in my throat, and I realized I had a problem, and the problem was me. And I turned over to my wife and I said, Honey, we have a problem. We have come to the place where we don't like each other. You ever faced that? Someone you love, you don't like. And the problem is you. And I apologized to her. I said, the problem is me. I said, I want to go to a counselor together. I want to go to somebody who can help us talk through this. And we went to a counselor together. And this godly Christian counselor who didn't know us at all, listened to our story for just a few minutes and then he leaned forward and he looked at us and he said, you two like to dance. I said, we do not. We're Seventh-day Adventists. (laughs) And he laughed. He said, no. He said, seriously, he said, you like to dance. He said, you like to do what I call power dancing. Both of us firstborn children who want to call the shots and be in charge. My wife in a much more passive way than me, but still, at that point in my life, it hadn't been massaged and refined and and turned into something that could be for God's glory instead of mine. And that counselor helped us work through that and learn what it means not to dance for power to best one another, 
both in our family and our home, but also in our other relationships, which was more my problem than hers, and even in my ministry. Why did I want my church to be effective? Why did I want my church to grow? Why did I want people to come to know Jesus? Why did I want people to experience his power and his transformation in their lives? At that point, I had to admit was because it would make me look good. Just like what Simone wanted for her sons of thunder. And I love what Jesus does, what Jesus does in verse 25 as this dissension has risen up among the disciples. It says, Jesus called them together. He called them together. That's exactly what needs to happen when there is tension and there is strife in the family, amen? Amen. When there is tension and there is striving in our relationships or in the church, we need to come together. When Jesus calls them to himself, he does so with tenderness and grace. He could have pointed his divine finger at them and said, You people are blowing it! What's wrong with you? Now later in the story we see times when he does that, he says, You guys don't have any faith. But not here. It's a tender moment. Later, when looking out over Jerusalem, Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 37, How how often I have longed to gather your children, Father, together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Oh, but you were not willing This is, at the same time, both a beautiful and a tragic statement, isn't it? Jesus' heart desire is to gather his children together and and hold them close like a, a mother hen would do under her wings. There with his disciple, I picture Jesus calling a huddle and saying something like, Guys, please, come here, come on, everybody pull in, everybody gather in, let's form a tight circle. Get a little closer so you can hear what I'm about to say now. What I'm going to share with you is really transformational stuff. Pay attention, guys. He knows that their default systems are set on selfish isolation. And so he calls them together. He doesn't take the two brothers aside and blast away, nor does he slam the ten for being indignant. He brings them back to community with one another, and he gives them a lesson in how different things are to be in his kingdom. There's a sharp contrast between the servanthood philosophy of the Savior and the footstool fable of the world. Notice what he says to them in verses 25 to 27. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. The footstool fable is the opposite of the spirit of servanthood in kingdom life. The footstool fable is the false notion that by making someone else my footstool, I am elevated and can exercise higher authority over them, and that signifies that I have accomplished something significant and worthwhile that they can't. And the problem is, it's a fable. It's an untruth. Let's just say it. It's a lie. Verse 26 began with a rebuke as Jesus reframed their understanding. He said, not so with you, guys. That's the way the world operates, but not so with you. A Christ follower must not operate this way. The meaning here is, it shall not be. Literally, it shall not be. It must not be. In the family of God, there is only one category of people, Jesus is saying, and that is selfless servants. Yes, 
Perhaps the Gentiles expend their energy jockeying for position and prestige, demanding the service of others. That's the way the people who don't know God and haven't spent time with Christ might be expected to behave. But Jesus says, that's not to be true of those of you who have hung out with me. Not you. You have a different value system. You act differently, or at least you're supposed to. And for you, greatness isn't determined by your position or your accomplishments or your titles or your achievements, but by your spirit of humility and generosity toward God and one another. Jesus finishes by saying the mark of true greatness is to be a servant of all. Wow. Wow. Talk about an upside-down kingdom. Here's the principle. If we want to become truly great, then we must give up our personal rights and privileges and serve others generously. Living in this world, we need to be repeatedly reminded that our central ambition should be to minister to people and not be admired by them. Amen? That's why if you say to me, Pastor, good sermon, my immediate response is, praise God. It's not about me. I learned that long ago. I have nothing to bring to this. I am a messed up human being. A lump of mud into which God has decided to put value and does something that is completely apart from me in order to accomplish his purposes and will. Isn't it true? Living in this world, we need to be repeatedly reminded of this. You, have you ever noticed how a conversation with Jesus usually doesn't turn out the way that we thought it would before it began? <laughs> it's true. Uh, we have so many things that need to be changed in our lives because we're more wowed by the world than most of us care to admit. God's ways are very different than our ways. Here are a few contrasts just from the book of Matthew. To gain your life in Matthew 16 verse 25, Jesus said you must lose it. What a contrast. You want to gain it, you have to lose it. To experience eternal life, he said in Matthew 18 3, you must have faith, the faith of a child. Wait a minute, I, I want to be known as this mature Christian. Yeah, well, then act like a child. Be completely dependent. To receive, he said in Matthew 19, verse 21, you must first give. Wait a minute, how can I receive if I'm not just pulling everything to myself? No, 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 no. Jesus says that's not the way it works in my upside-down kingdom. To receive, you must give. And to receive generously, you must give generously. In Matthew 20, verse 26, Jesus says, To be great at all, you must be servant of all. What we learn from Jesus in following him is that in God's kingdom, we are just one big body, the body of Christ, with no part of the body being more important than another except the head. Amen? Which is Christ himself. And if we are to be concerned with greatness at all, then it is achieved through service, humble, generous, sacrificial service to all. Not picking my favorites, not treating the people I actually get along with or have something in common with or like more than others, treating them better than others. No. One of the things I loved about the last church I pastored which I'm going to tell you now was the most transformational experience in my ministry or life. It was based on small groups, and these small groups met every week in each other's homes, and the church was really boiled down to functioning organically through these groups and delivering the ministries of the church through these groups. And we would worship together on Sabbath and do all of the corporate things of the body together on Sabbath. But in the groups during the week, one of the things that was just so amazing was people who would normally in the world not even interact with each other, not even like each other, who would go in the opposite direction of each other in the world's normal way of doing things would be in the same group. 
We had the wealthiest man in the church hosting a group of men in his home. This was a men's group that he happened to have. Hosting a men's group which had the poorest homeless man in the church coming to his group. And they loved each other like brothers. And he would meet up with him and talk with him and pray with him. And, 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 and the guy felt comfortable calling him or calling others in the group. And, and there was just this unity that is an uncommon thing because that's what Christ wants for his church. And somebody you wouldn't even normally like because maybe they don't smell as good or maybe they don't look the way you look and they don't have a home like you have or a vehicle like you drive suddenly None of it mattered. Only one thing mattered. Being united in Christ together. Because this is the fourth thing we must learn. To follow the example of Jesus. And wasn't that the example of Jesus? Jesus doesn't just shake up our self-centered motives and tell us to expect difficulties. He also challenges us to put others first. And in case we're wondering how to do this, he offers himself as the perfect role model. In verse 28, it says, The the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To pay an ultimate sacrifice. This verse has been rightly regarded as one of the most precious of all Christ's sayings in the the Gospels. Jesus is both our example and our motivation. He wasn't focused on keeping his position and getting more. In fact, according to Philippians 2 verses 3 to 7, Jesus left his throne in order to serve us and Paul calls us to do the same. Jesus served the needs of others and then he demonstrated the ultimate act of service when he gave his life, his life, eternal God. Eternal God, never in all eternity past, and that doesn't even make sense to us. That blows our mind, doesn't it? We can't understand eternity because right now you're saying, Pastor Dan, it's 12.15, let's get done with this thing. I'm getting hungry. I got up late, I didn't eat breakfast, I'm a little bit cranky, let's just get out of here. We don't understand eternity. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise you right now, this is not going to go on for eternity. Okay? Amen. Amen. I'm going to get hungry too by about 3 o'clock. <laughs> Jesus, who had only ever lived in eternity in timelessness, becomes a human being with physical limitations, with human hurts in order to to be a model for us. The true standard of greatness is the Savior's pattern of self-sacrifice. The late Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's Restaurants, now I'm really messing with you, it's getting close to eating time, I believe Wendy's has salads and veggie burgers. Not Loma Linda veggie burgers, but, you know, those kind with the broccoli sticking out of it. The late Dave Thomas once appeared on the cover of their annual report, business report, dressed in a knee-length work apron holding a mop and a plastic bucket. And here's how he described that picture. He says, I got my MBA long before I got my GED. At Wendy's, MBA does not mean Master of Business Administration, he continued. It means mop bucket attitude. (laughs) Dave Thomas got his MBA from following the model of the master. He was a believer. You might call this bucket theology. Do you and I have a bucket theology? Now we're winding down here. Pay attention closely. I know you're tired, but pay attention 
because this is important as we head into next Sabbath when we celebrate communion together. Do you remember what Pilate did when he had the chance to acquit Jesus? He called for a bucket and he washed his hands of the whole thing. Matthew 27, 24, we're told that when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd and he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. Don't blame me. It's your fault, your responsibility. Pilate's bucket is a bucket of selfishness and blame. Unfortunately, Pilate's paradigm is alive and well today. He he knew what he should have done, but he took the easy route. He passed on to others the responsibility that should have been his. His only concern is looking out for himself and his own interests. How will what I do affect me? Many people today pass the buck and wash their hands of personal responsibility. Pilate's bucket is the wrong choice, brothers and sisters. It's the wrong choice. It leads to death and to destruction. But there's another choice. Jesus, the night before, the very night before, also called for a bucket. And when he got it, he proceeded to wash the dirty, dusty feet of his disciples, not his own hands removing any responsibility for himself, instead taking all responsibility unto himself and sacrificially serving the others around him. And so while Pilate's pail is filled with selfishness, Jesus' basin consists of selfless sacrifice. In John 13, verses 4 to 5, we see that Jesus and his disciples are sharing the Passover meal together. And when Jesus got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured the water into the basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around them. And Peter didn't like it. As the guest of honor was doing this, he he got upset. Have you ever stopped and wondered why Peter was so upset with Jesus when Jesus came to him to wash his dirty, smelly feet? It was because Peter knew that that wasn't Jesus' job. At least he thought he knew that. Washing feet, he thought, was the task of the lowest of the household servants. It was was unheard of for the teacher, the master, to wash his followers' feet. If anything, they should be washing his feet. Peter knew that. And so indignation rises up in him. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, Improving Your Serve, wrote, The room was filled with proud hearts and dirty feet, and the disciples were willing to fight for a throne, but not for a towel. Listen. Jesus is revealing that servanthood is the fact, is in fact the responsibility of those who follow him. Sacrificial, selfless servanthood. In John 13, verses 14 and 15, he says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Amen? And he says, my followers will be likewise. The disciples, we are often like them, filled with a worldly spirit of criticism and competition. And we try to position ourselves and and we try to be seen in the best light and to maneuver things for our own advantage. We desperately, we desperately, brothers and sisters, need to learn this lesson of humble servanthood. And that's why Jesus says, you should do as I have done for you. As Seventh-day Adventists, we we take seriously this injunction. We, We not only want to live lives of service, but whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, we offer people the opportunity to participate in the symbol of foot washing, which we're going to do next week. We do it as a reenactment of heaven emptying itself for the sake of earth. 
And during the worship service next week, there will be a time to pause and to provide everyone an opportunity to experience Christ's basin of selflessness and to engage washing the feet of another. But, but this will be a symbolic service next week. Now here's where it's really important as we close. It may be that sometime this week, you need to get in touch with a brother or a sister and apologize for something that you have done that may have offended or hurt them and dishonored God. The Bible says if we want Christ's cleansing, well, in fact, Jesus taught us to pray, pray, forgive us our debts as we what? Forgive our debtors. Forgive us our wrongs against you, God, as we forgive those who have wronged us or who we apologize to those whom we have wronged. We get rid of the grudges. So maybe you need to begin this week by washing the heart of another with your words of repentance and an attitude of humility. Nothing would honor God more and nothing would bring more blessing. Jesus said that if we follow his example, we can overcome the world's footstool fable and find true joy in managing our motives, anticipating the difficulties that will come in following him, putting others first and following Christ's example. So what are we waiting for? One night a farmer and his wife had gone to bed. In the middle of the night, a terrible rainstorm came pouring down on the house, just pounding down on the house, and he could hear it pounding off his, his old dirty truck outside. And, and then there was thunder, and there was lightning crashing and flashing across the sky, and an awful explosion as lightning struck an old shed in the backyard. And the farmer raced to the window and his wife sat up startled in bed and she said, My dear, what was that? Is the world coming to an end? <laughs> and the farmer turned with a look of relief on his face and he said, No, it's just what I've been waiting for. And his wife said, What do you mean? And the farmer said, The hard rain has washed the car, the truck, and the lightning has taken down the old junky shed and, and now I'm just waiting for an earthquake to shake the potatoes out of the ground. Sometimes we just think that if we wait, God will resolve everything. If we just wait, he'll take care of everything. We don't have to do anything, but he calls us instead to follow his example. If we want to become Christ-like servants, we can't just wait for something to happen. Jesus gave us his example as the antithesis of this world. And Jesus ends his ministry in the upper room in much the same way as letters from the 18th century often ended with the standard inscription, I am, with due respect, your obedient, humble servant. Will you determine to kick aside the world's footstool fable and live your life as an obedient, humble servant? It's what Christ calls us to. And when we do, wow, what a power there is in his church. The world is used to what it looks like to have families in strife and striving. The world is used to what it looks like to have church people or people in businesses or service clubs in the community have smiles on their faces and politely shake each other's hands but behind the scenes have strife and division. What the world has never seen anywhere but in the church of Jesus Christ when we allow him to do it is a people who with self-sacrificing service to one another love each other as Jesus has loved us. Let's do it, folks. Let's let him do it through us. Stand with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, wow, we are...
challenged again by your word. We see so much more of ourselves in those disciples than we would care to admit. And actually, when we stand long enough gazing in the mirror of your holiness and perfectness, we, we realize that we are so desperately in need of being cleaned up and transformed by you. It doesn't seem to matter how long how long we have spent in your presence like those disciples. There are just times when you flash your beauty and your holiness before us and we realize we fall so far short. Next week we're going to celebrate that, God. Oh, we're going to come and we're just going to focus on the beauty of Jesus and what he's done for us, his grace and his tender mercy, his transforming power. But this week we are called to be broken on the rock, to allow our proud hearts to be laid bare, to acknowledge that we are sinners and that we fall short of your glory. To realize that our relationships are so often imperfect and so self-centered. And Lord, where we've hurt somebody or been hurt, to make it right in your love with your grace. And so do it in our lives, God. Make us, make us into this family you envision us to be so that others will see that there is a, an uncommon power in our midst, the power of Jesus' self-sacrificing love and service. For your glory, we pray, not for our own. Amen.